Okay, let's start. Uh, today, my guest is uh, Karina Gardner. She's a successful entrepreneur. So uh, I think you guys are going to like this episode. She's doing some great stuff in the business world. So uh, please, uh, Karina, tell a little bit about your story yourself, and then we'll get started. Awesome. Thanks for having me on the show, by the way. I think this will be really fun. So um, my background is in design, uh, but it wasn't always that way. And people always ask, like, are you super creative or can you draw really well? And the answer is, I think I've always been creative, but drawing? Huh. No. And so I think one of the funniest things about design is that it's not necessarily that you have to be a fantastic drawer. You just have to be able to see the world in a way that allows you to get what you're thinking about onto your computer screen or onto paper. And I think when you kind of change the way you think about design as something that can be learned, it is really, truly something that anyone can learn. That's why we teach it in a four-year university degree. Um, and so when I got started, my undergrad degree was in communications and I wanted to get into advertising. But the problem was that every time I, you know, looked or was building something, I had to have visuals. And so I was like, you know what, I think I have to learn Photoshop, which was really brand new at the time when I was doing it. And so I started learning it. And what I found was I, I really wanted to do a master's degree in design because that way I could be a better advertiser. Like go do a master's degree in design. And of course, I fall in love with design and it was like, I am out for this advertising thing. I'm not doing it. Like I want to be a designer. This is so cool. So I got a master's degree and a PhD in design um, and then immediately started a design business, um, which is now about 16 years old. Three years ago, I started a design program where I integrated uh, what I had learned from owning a design business along with the academic portion, because I used to teach at the University of Minnesota, into a single program. And that brings us up to date now. Yeah. So how is the whole entire ecosystem of that industry? The good, the bad, and the ugly? Well... So, uh, I mean, so there's a couple of different industries here. First of all is the university system, right? Or like the online teaching space, right? That's one system. There's really not uh, very many pe people teaching. There's certainly no one teaching the way we're teaching. There's a lot of like small classes you can take out there in design. You can learn Illustrator, InDesign, Photoshop. You know, there are lots of those little things. Um, but we're kind of a more all-inclusive program. We're kind of, we always tell people we're like the master's degree you never thought you were going to get um, because it's more academically based. It's more business-based and that's why we're different than everyone else. Um so there's that piece. The second piece is we're really niche down. So we're not just all design. We don't take all designers. We're niche down to the craft and the fabric industries. And so we only teach designers how to work in mediums that they can sell digitally or online. Um, so that is, um, you know, SVG files, which is Cricut silhouette files, stickers, clip art for businesses, um, maybe printables, but there are a lot of different realms you can get into that are really niched out. Um, and, and that's what we teach. And that industry is there's, there's tons of people in the crafting market, tons of people in the quilting, the fabric markets, but not very many people teaching how to run businesses. In fact, I don't know if there's anyone teaching how to run a business in those markets. Okay. And uh, how's the industry has evolved over the years? Um, so it, once again, two different things. The crafting industry has evolved immensely. When I first got into it, it was digital scrapbooking, um, which was an online space where you could sell digital like 12 by 12 papers that people could buy and they could print out by themselves. Digital scrapbooking isn't so hot anymore, but SVG files, files for Cricut, silhouette machines, that kind of thing. Those are really hot. And, you know, a good indicator of how that market has changed is Etsy. Etsy is huge. There's 20 million shops or so, right? So there are lots of different ways people are selling um, and maybe not just crafting because that's home decor and everything else as well. But the fact that so many people are going on there and selling the way they're selling is really kind of changed the marketplace for those that are in the crafting and the quilting realms. The other thing is that when I started in the quilting realm, I'm a fabric designer for Riley Blake, you know, most people purchased paper PDFs and somewhere along the middle of the way, there was a switch and people started really buying PDFs 
uh, directly online. So like there was not a physical, there was just like a downloadable version. And um, so I'm just, there's a shift by uh, the actual consumer marketplace. They're kind of moving more into digital or they feel much more comfortable into digital, which they did not feel 16 years ago. It, it was just a new industry. So someone getting into that uh, industry, whether it's craft or design, what are the different ways that they can uh, earn income? So I think the biggest way is to actually be a designer of the product. Like, so if you're a quilt designer, you design the quilt and then you sell the PDF of that quilt, right? That's one way you can do it. Another way is just finding like there's so many wonderful realms, like, for example, teachers, you just think about the consumer teachers need packets for their classes, things that they're doing, planners that they're working on, stickers that they're working on. So if you can think of a consumer market like teachers, you can build products specifically for teachers that they're willing to download or some of them will even buy physical goods so that they can have for their classroom. So it's really about finding the niche that you would like to work in. Um, as a designer or someone who's creating digital products, because that easily creates and translates into dollars for your business if you can find the right consumers to purchase the things that they need um, in their classroom that they don't want to design themselves, right? Uh, so you built a multi-million dollar business in less than three years. How was that process? Crazy. It still is crazy. <laughs> It's a crazy process. Uh, it's not something I would be like, hey, everyone, go do this. Uh, in fact, this is our year three. We just barely hit year three and we're slowing down. Like, I'm kind of like, we have to slow down a little bit. We're not going to take in as many people as before just because of all the process things that we need to put into place. Um, it, it really is pushed by need. Um, if you have a product that people really want, then it's very easy to sell it, right? Because you're really trying to put out there a product that is, is necessary. It's not just extra. And for us, we're the only ones in our current space doing what we're doing. And it's very difficult to find anyone else who are doing exactly what we're doing um, or even close to what we're doing at the level that we're doing it at. And so you really do have to choose something that is for us very niched out, um, become the expert in it. And, you know, I was a practitioner for a long time. Like I, I did very well as a designer and so, uh, owning my own business. And so making that transition to educate people on how to do it exactly the way I had done it was relatively easy. That was like a, it was a natural progression. Um, so if you're in any kind of business space, like making sure that you become the expert in that space, then it's easy to make that transition into whatever you're trying to do. And we could have gone a number of different ways. We didn't have to do education. We could have done, we have something called design suite agency. We could have just built out a huge, uh, agency for designers that, and we still actually have that. We could have, uh, built a shop and just sold goods, right? So there are a lot of ways you can go. It doesn't always have to be education. It just so happened that in this particular instance, we decided to go the education route. And uh, how's, your, uh, how's your creative process when you're designing? So for me, design is I get really easily into flow state because I've been doing it for so long, right? If you haven't been doing something for a long time, I think it's hard sometimes to get into flow state. But for me, um, especially if I'm working on, I just finished a new fabric line for my company. It's not out yet, but I did some initial quick sketches of what I really wanted to do. So just like some quick sketches. And then usually for me, especially for a fabric line, cause that's a little different than some of the other things I design. I really delve into one fabric, usually the secondary or the master fabric and make it like as good as I can make it because every other piece, every, so there are 18 pieces in the line, every other piece will match in color, in size. And like, you know, it's got to go together with this initial first print. And so I usually, I'm, I, I wish I could do the master first. I never can. I know designers who can, for me, it's the secondary print. And I usually design that with a lot of intention. And then I build out all the blenders, all the smaller scale pieces. And then I usually build the master last. And uh, that, so that's my process for a fabric line. Uh, a good fabric line probably takes me a solid five days to design. Um, 
Other things like SVG files usually take me only 30 minutes to an hour. So every design piece will, will depend on where it's going and who it's going to. When doing some research, uh, I found out that uh, there's intellectual property involved. I wasn't aware of that. So how is that? Uh, how does that work? So once you have designed something, it is yours, right? And so you have to decide whether you're going to sell it as exclusive uh, to whoever you're selling it to, or if you are going to be non-exclusive and you're going to sell it in different mediums. I'm very interested to see if at some point design will get NTFs, like something that will kind of like chain to hold on to our digital product. So only a certain number will go out, but we're just not there yet. It's, it's not happening. Um, you can't, like, we have been seeing a lot of stealing in particular from China for designers. Um, there's not a ton you can do. That's the hardest part about it. Uh, but you can, you know, hopefully you can use your country and try to go after designs that are being stolen from another country. That's, that's probably the hardest bit about being a designer right now. It's so easy for your stuff to be picked up and stolen, which is kind of crazy and insane. Um, so there is some of that. The other thing that we're kind of dealing with right now is AI. So, uh, there's a lot of people using AI in the industry and right now it's still a little confusing to me. I'm, we're, I'm getting into it a little bit more, but, um, AI is technically not yours. Like you don't own it. And so if someone creates something via AI and they're out there selling it, I just don't know what the repercussions are going to be because it's all so new. We're kind of in new territory. But I tell my designers not to basically do not resell AI because we don't know really uh, what the intellectual property is on that or if it's actually owned by you know, whoever owns the AI on that. So the other reason not to use AI right now is it all looks the same. So it's not great in terms of design. If anything, I think that designers who are actually producing really different and interesting work are getting a lot more out of their design work than the AI stuff, because the AI stuff all looks the same. I just had an episode about that, about the AI and the, the intellectual property. And uh, I was talking about that issue. Who is the owner of uh, the AI when someone uses the machine to... Uh, it's pretty interesting stuff. So uh, you have to see a lawyer and uh, about that or research it on, on a podcast to have more information. But it's pretty interesting. Uh, another thing I wanted to talk about is uh, the fabric line. You were talking about that before. Talk to us about the process of uh, doing the... the the fabric line that you do one, two, and uh, the process with the manufacturer and all that. Yeah. So, you know, when you're working with a manufacturer, you kind of get to know their nuances. And I work directly with Riley Blake. I was the creative director of a scrapbooking company called Cartabella. And their nuances, totally different than a fabric company, right? So when you're working with a manufacturer, you're kind of dealing with what they see overall in the industry. They're the expert. And most designers don't spend enough time really listening to what their creative directors are saying. Because they, what they see is, you know, I put in a line and they were like, Karina, we, you know, we want more color. We'd like a pop. We'd like X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, okay, great. What I can't see is the other 10 or 15 lines that they're looking at. And they're trying to make sure all their lines are diversified, that they all look different, right? And so sometimes I see designers get upset because they – they want their creative director to tell them their stuff is just perfect and wonderful. When at the end of the day, a creative director is seeing like all the different things that are happening in the industry. So most of the time for a fabric line, I usually go through two or three sets of revisions. So I send in the initial line. I try to make it the way I would like, because it's my name is on it. Like on the, the salvage of a fabric, it's Karina Gardner's line, right? For Riley Blake. And so I want to make sure it's true to me. So it's got to be authentic to me. So I put in the first line. Then I get feedback and I usually get uh, this, this last time I just got a list, a long list of like things they'd like to change, see change. So I made all those changes. I changed some of the scales, changed some of the colors and, and I sent it back in. I haven't gotten the next round of feedback, but I expect another round of feedback because they're still going to be like, well, cause I did some crazy things. I added colors I normally don't use. I was like, I want to try this, like, see what you guys think about this. And so um, I'll get the next round of feedback. It'll be much less than the uh, initial one. Like they'll be like, oh, we like this. We don't like this. And uh, it will probably 
be done at that point. Usually only takes three, sometimes four rounds. Um, and then at that point I send it into them. I find out when it's coming out based on when it's coming out. That's when I can start promoting it. So fabric lines are different because they are on pre-sell before they ever come out. Cause that's how they know how much yardage to print from it. So about six months before this print actually goes to production. It actually goes to the mill. Uh, right now, most of the 100% cottons that you purchase in the United States is coming from South Korea. So that's where most of the mills are. There aren't any mills in the United States anymore that I know of. There's print presses like Spoonflower, but there's not any mills. And so um, that's it'll, it'll go over there. We have a Pantone process that we look at to make sure colors are correct. They send me what they call strike-offs. So I get these pieces of fabric and I go through them. I match up the colors to make sure they're correct. And then I mark the fabric, like usually with a pencil or pen, and I'll write notes directly on the fabric. If colors aren't exactly the way I want them to be, I make those changes. I send them back to my creative director. And um, I say, these are the ones I think we need to change. I don't like. Um, and then she will send it back to the mill. They'll color correct and send them back to her. Usually on the second round, they don't send them to me. Some designers like the second round. I don't. I don't really care because my creative director knows me really well. I've been working with her for 10 years. And so instead, she'll call me and just say, I think they're looking pretty good now. And I'm like, if you approve, I approve. That's good. And we'll call it good. Then six months later, or whenever the timeline is, it takes like a year to get a fabric line uh, fully finished. Then they will, you know, about three months before that, they start selling the line and then it will go in production. I will get the prints for it. I might get some digital prints first so that I can make some stuff so that we can start showcasing the line. Um, and then the line will come out. It will last usually about a year. That's about how long. So my last fabric line is out of print. It's really hard to find already. Sometimes I will talk to people who are looking for a line that I did five years ago. It is almost impossible to find. Like people will be like, how do I find this line? And I'm like, good luck. Like maybe go on eBay, maybe go on Etsy and see if someone has some scrap yardage, but otherwise that's, it's gone. So, um, that's one of the beautiful things about the hundred percent quilting cotton industry is because you know, it's going to be gone. You will purchase what you actually need, uh, when you have it. And that's why you get some fabric orders. How do you determine the value, the worth of your product? Um, well, for the most part, I don't have to the industry, especially fabric is pretty set. So most contracts are the same in the fabric industry. I've really seen, seen very, uh, for Riley Blake, it's a percentage for like Modite. It might be like a, a cents per yard kind of situation, but, um, in, in truth, most of the industries now, and you're seeing this across industries for contracts, even for, you know, any kind of notebook or anything that you do out there, uh, it is, it's pretty standard at this point. So unless you're a really new designer and you're willing to take work at a much lower price at the most, we're kind of to a point where like, you're not negotiating a deal with people. Like it just is what it is in certain industries. And if someone is going on the luxury, uh, on the luxury road, what, uh, what is that like? What, tell me what you mean by that. I mean, if they're creating for uh high, uh, for uh, uh how can i say that like to rich people they're creating design for rich people oh okay so luxury brands you're probably working in-house you're probably not a contractor and owning your own business like if you looked worked for like louis vuitton or coco chanel you would work directly in-house for them creating designs so they're on a salary they're not making a royalty or a business uh amount do you do uh, collaborations Rarely. Yeah. I rarely do collaborations. Most of my work is all on my own and that's because of copyright issues and all of those other things. It gets really sticky in the design world to be doing a ton of partnerships. And what about, uh, do you attend trade shows and all that, uh, uh throughout the year? Yeah. So I haven't been to, cause COVID kind of like messed with that. Right. Uh, but, uh, the main ones that you will, you'll see the, in the quilt industry, they have something called quilt market, um, in the scrapbooking and the crafting industry, they had something called CHA, the craft and hobby association. Um, I think it is now called, it's changed a couple of times the name of it. And so I actually don't create ovation or something like that. Um, so there's those things. Um, 
I'm trying to think what other markets you would probably go to. I think at this point in time, there's not as many markets. Most of it is being done completely online at this point. Uh, do you think education wise, do you think someone could be self-taught or they have to go to, uh, to school to learn the whole thing? I, I have mixed emotions about this because I see a lot of self-taught people and they're great. I actually think there's a lot of artwork out there and design work. That's really great. And it's been done by self-taught people. Um, I think where I see kind of like the standstill is they can only get to a certain point. Um, before their stuff, like they don't know how to explain the stuff. They don't have the vocabulary for it. They can't break out of the current market they're in because they don't understand other markets. So the answer is it's a little bit of mixed. I, that's kind of why we actually created our program because we saw so many people who were good at stuff, but they just need a little education. They didn't need a four-year degree, right? Like we're like, you don't need a four-year degree. You just need some help getting your stuff back up to level. And so that's part of the reason we decided to Uh, create design suite because what we'll do is we meet with a lot of artists, fine artists, uh, people who know a little bit of the software, people who are super creative, lots of crafters and surface pattern designers, and they will come to us and they'll spend a year with us and we can kind of fast track them, make sure they have the design coursework to make sure that they're necessary, you know, they're getting expert guidance. We're looking at their stuff and their stuff is getting better. So we need to up level it. But then after that, usually they're good to go. So I would say mix. We're kind of the in-between. Um, I, I still do promote a four-year or two-year, like an associate's degree in design, or even just if you have a regular degree and a master's degree in design, you can totally jump that and just do a master's degree. I think there's a lot of value in that because that kind of education really will help you know exactly what you need to do to move forward. And a lot of times people get stuck because they just, they don't have enough design education to know what works best. So what would you say to someone who wants to get started in that industry? What are the the main stuff or certain things that they would have to pay attention to before getting into that industry? A hundred percent, you have to know Adobe products. So it's not like design isn't like um, administration work or something where you can jump in and just learn on the job. You actually have to know software. So it's kind of like an attorney. Like you have to know the, the legal terms that you're working with in order to start going. So number one is you have to start building the skill. So and that's why school of some sort or education or coursework online is pretty much necessary unless you want to do it yourself and, and learn Illustrator and Photoshop and InDesign on your own. I, I don't love that. And I'll tell you why, because you're going to get lots of mixed signals. You're not sure what you're going to be doing. You're kind of like, it's it's just a little harder to learn software in that way. Versus taking some kind of course. And I'm not even saying my course. I actually think there are better courses out there just for Illustrator. We really teach business, you know? So if you you need to first learn Illustrator, Photoshop, make sure you're good there. The second tier to that is you have to, I do think you need to have some kind of business education. I think if you can learn how to sell your stuff online or sell yourself to manufacturers, then that's probably the next step is, is trying to find those networks so that you can learn what to do best. Part of it is going to shows. If you can go to shows, that will open your eyes to what the industry actually is like. Where can people find you on social media or the internet? Um, so KarinaGardner.com is easy. C-A-R-I-N-A, Gardner, G-A-R-D-N-E-R. Um, the other thing you can do is my newest book is out. It's called Make Art That Sells. It's on Amazon. And if you go to makeartbook.com, there's a masterclass there that I'm going to give you guys for free. So right now it says it costs money. Do not pay for it. Instead, put in the code Make art. It's the second link. There's the link to the book. And then the second link is to a masterclass. Just click on that link um, on makeartbook.com. Click on that link, put in the code make art, and that will give you access just for the fun of it for the lessons for that book. And if you're in any kind of creative field, like you're uh, writing a book, writing music, there's a formula there that will help you kind of figure out how to make whatever you're doing that actually sells. Uh, thank you, Karina, for being here. It was nice meeting you and talking to you. Uh, on that note, thank you, everybody, for taking the time to listen to this podcast. My name is Richard Lesperance. I go by the name of My Man Richard. And we'll see you on the next episode, everybody. Goodbye.